Welcome to Below the Line, Griffith University's independent, comprehensive expert analysis of the 2019 federal election campaign. On today's show, my colleagues' panel of experts are going to discuss four of our top 10 seats to watch. These are the seats of Dixon, Brisbane, Dawson and Herbert. We're going to have a look at the issues and themes that are emerging in the campaign here in Queensland and we're going to take a really good look at a wildcard seat uh, which is, may come into contention on the 18th of May. Let's move first to the seat of Dixon. Jenny, all eyes are on the seat of Dixon with the incumbent Peter Dutton. What are we going to see on May 18th? Well, I don't think we'll have a result on May 18th. I mean, as soon as Peter had the failed uh, candidacy as running as Prime Minister, all seats were going, all eyes were going to be on Dixon. He holds it by a very slender margin of 1.7%. It's one of those northern Brisbane seats where it's a very mixed bag. So you have this kind of new urban areas that vote for Labor around like Bray Park or Kalanga or Marumba Downs. And then you get into more regional areas. So you've got Dabra, Albany, Albany Creek and into Samford, which go more for the LNP. So it's not a kind of a straightforward kind of seat. Mm. Dutton's working very hard in that uh, campaign, it, absolutely everywhere. His core flutes, a uh, huge amount of advertising. Um, he you know, claimed that he'd uh, assembled a war chest of $650,000. Um, what is going on on the ground? What, you know, what's the action? He, he's been um, you know, such a polarising figure, Jenny. Um, he's running against a, you know, a strong uh, Labor candidate in Ali France. Mm. Um, you know, what, what's the, the vibe on the ground? Well, I don't think he's been that visible at community events. So he's got the money to spend on those kind of external, um, you know, parts of the campaign. But he hasn't wanted to get out there and engage with Ali France, as far as I can tell, at local kind of events around um, different issues. Um, get up there, and I just, th I think in Queensland, that could be a mixed blessing. Mm. And I think after what happened with the, you know, the anti Adani caravan. <laughs> people, pe pe people don't like being told by people outside their electorate how to vote. Yeah, so. Tracy, that's a real Queensland phenomenon. And we often talk about, you know, not many of us rail against, you know, the Queensland's different interpretation from, yeah. you know, the, the gallery or, or from interstate. But, but I think Jenny makes an excellent point. People don't like being told what to do from people who aren't from here. No, absolutely. I completely agree. So, so do you agree that that Adani caravan was, you know? I think, it, I think it was a miscalculation. There's a lot of people around the country who care about this issue, but for people particularly in North Queensland, it's also about jobs and employment for them. And so environmental issues, while I'm not saying they don't care about those, there's also you know, the fact, other factors to consider for them. And having Bob Brown and his caravan of well-intentioned people, I'm sure, coming up and, um, and arguing, uh, you know, telling them how they should vote, um, and you know, protecting the reef that they live with every day. Yeah. Um, I it was think, an absolute yeah, it was gift, a wasn't it, to One Nation, Jacob, don't you think? And also to, you know, to Matt Canavan, and we've seen very little of the National um, Party mm. uh, because they're such a problem for, they're such a liability for, uh, for Scott Morrison. You know, what did you make of, of that as a sort of a political opportunity? Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. I mean, these, these sort of northern Queensland seats really are at the epicentre of this sort of environment versus economy debate that's sort of sprung up and that the coalition in particular is really keen to engage in that debate on those terms and so yeah this the caravan was a really good way and a good opportunity for uh, especially national MPs like Matt Canavan to to really seize on you know it's one or the other mm. um, and, and and such a yeah. shambolic kind of uh, you know it's been so shambolic among the LNP in those seats we've got you know George Christensen in Dawson all the controversy about him spending a good deal of his time in uh, in the Philippines you know Michelle Landry invoking the spectre of a Barnaby Joyce return I mean it was a total gift yes. uh, and as you say Tracy I think really well intentioned it sort of reminds me of um, of Batman uh, you know the Batman by-election being all about the <laughs> done in mind, which uh, just you know is sort of emblematic, don't you think? How much um, did Peter Dutton's comments about Ali France using her disability as an excuse um, damage him? Do you think? I think he's not a man who takes a backward step. So the fact that he actually, after a couple of days, had to come out and issue an apology, I thought was very telling. And he also, 
immediately gave her a profile she hadn't had before. So what happened was there were millions of newspaper stories explaining who she was, explaining her background, explaining how she got the disability, protecting her son. It really wasn't good for him. Mm. And it seemed to also fuel some online um, donations for her uh, in a way that uh, that she's made much of. Mm. Um, so, you know, other other issues we should be looking for in the seat of Dixon. I mean, a big uh, election, big uh, commitments in the budget about. Uh, the Bruce Highway upgrade, um, you know, health and, and the, the, the mm. congestion kind of, the CBIs, the congestion busting uh, infrastructure um, that is arguably a bit delayed um, mm. from the 2013-14 budget, but we could sort of talk about that another time. Um, you know, what, what else, Tracy, uh, should we be looking for in the Cedar Dixon on the 18th? Uh, well, I'll be looking at it as an interesting barometer as to where the conservative liberals sit now. Mm. You know, we have seen successive parliaments being dominated by the factions that the LNP, that the Liberals have, and the Liberals and the Nationals have, even though they don't officially call them factions, and you know, and we've seen a lot of influence from the conservative side of that come through on a whole range of different policies, and the spill on Turnbull, Dutton's support of um, of Morrison, and first of all, he's not him putting up his own hand. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be really um, an indication of whether or not people are a tired of that kind of you know really base politicking and to whether, which I think is the case, the country's moved on from those really sloganistic, simplistic debates. Mm. They actually are worried about climate change. They do actually want to see action. And, um, and I think, you know, it will be interesting to see if that results in um, his vote declining. Look, it's such a temptation to stay on the seat of Dixon, but we better move on. Um, one of our other uh, hot seats to watch that Griffith experts have picked is the seat of Brisbane, um, you know, held by um, first-term MP um, Trevor Evans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's gone kind of both ways. It's, uh, it's a seat that's uh, been redistributed as the area's gentrified. Um, you know, it's certainly the seat that I live in. Um, Trevor Evans was a Dutton staffer, um, National Retail Association, uh, you know, he's reasonably popular, uh, you know, is, is holding the seat by, um, a re you know, a reasonable margin. It should have been in normal circumstances a safe seat. He, he you know, yeah. consolidated uh, the position. Uh, I don't think that's the case now. What do you think is going on in Brisbane? And it's an interesting mix of suburbs, isn't it, in terms of sort of, you know, Kelvin Grove, um, New Farm, Tenerife, uh, you know around Ash, uh, sort of Newmarket and some of the, Wilston, some of the, you know, the property issues I think are salient there. I thought yeah. the franking credits issue could really play there. What do people think? Yeah. Uh, I think it's interesting because normally those inner city seats, say in Sydney or Melbourne, that are likely to turn over are because they have socially conservative Liberal members. So it's the Tony Abbott thing is the classic mm. thing. So mm. the electorate's moved on. Whereas in Brisbane you don't have that. So Trevor Evans was of course on the right side of the same-sex marriage debate. Uh, he's more at the um, small L Liberal end of the Liberal Party. So it's surprising to me that it's come into contention because it is such a gentrifying seat. The demographics are on his side. But the ALP have made it a priority seat. So they've spotted something there. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't be putting scarce resources into a seat like that, that they didn't have that they didn't think a chance. They could, yep. and, the, and the um, ALP candidate, Paul Newbury, mm -hmm. is a, he's got a PhD, he's a specialist in um, the transition to renewable energy. energy. So obviously climate change must be playing into that somewhere. And of course, amazingly, Andrew Bartlett, former mm -hmm. senator, recently recycled senator is again running uh, he's running uh, as the green the and, and the green vote in that seat could be quite significant yeah Tracy what do you yeah think? no I think that's right I think the green vote will be significant and um, and preferences will you know their preferences may well truly help the ALP mm. um, and yeah and um, and Bartlett for the Senate would be um, oh is he going to be in the Senate no 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 he's, no, he's, he's actually, he's actually running running in the House of Reps in the House of Reps terribly sorry and he's Andrew. a local um, yes you know he's yeah. a local from that area yeah that's 
right. So, I mean, I think I have been seeing some polling that actually indicates that, um, you know, the, the Greens are very hopeful for Brisbane, um, but whether or not that, that actually holds that to be the case, I think we wait to see. But, you know, if Trevor Evans loses that seat, I mean, you know, Labor's had a pretty mixed uh, group of candidates in that seat, some pretty ordinary candidates, frankly, in the last um, uh, few elections. I think they got a primary vote of 26 or 27 per cent in Brisbane at, at 2016 mm -hmm. poll, which was a, you know, a historic low. Um, but if Trevor Evans loses that seat, it will be really about the Turnbull leadership challenge, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Which I think Turnbull would have had a, a fair bit of support among the people of Brisbane. Yes, exactly. And that is that demographic where you have a lot of, as you've indicated, wealthy retirees who might be a bit worried about the franking credits. But they are... I've had my big ears <laughs> in the breeze at the at the grocery store uh, about what the, the, the burgers of, uh, of Brisbane are thinking. I think it's a hard one to pick, but you know, mm. we really debated it, didn't we, in terms and, of it should be in our list. And I think it's also the thing that there was was such a swing at the last election, it is likely to come back a bit. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we better move on, see? We could stay all day on each of them. Um, Tracy Herbert. Herbert. The seat of Herbert in, in Herbert, and around Townsville. The most um, marginal seat in all of Australia, Herbert, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, Cathy O'Toole won it for Labor on 30, with 37 votes on it. It's a margin of 0.02%. Wow. Um, and she won it due to One Nation preferences last time. Mm. Took a month for her result to actually finally be confirmed by the Electoral Commission. Um, so I think it's going to be a really, a really interesting seat. Polling indicates that at the moment the LNP and Labor are on around 50-50. But um, the United Australia Party is up there, spending a lot of money up there, and the preferences from them may well push the LNP over the line. And they've got a candidate in Philip Thompson who was a, a war veteran. Um, he's very articulate. Mm. Um, he's coming out very strongly about Adani. Um, so is O'Toole, mind you. Yes, I mean, yes. you know, she signed the pledge. Yes. So, um, you know, those are the sorts of factors that are going to really But for people, people outside Queensland, it's very important to understand that Townsville, well, Townsville is always such a complex kind of um, yeah. community, but an enormous army presence. Yes, absolutely. Uh, an extraordinary army base there, isn't there? I yes, mean, you know. that's right. I mean, I think if you had to use a few words to sum up Herbert, it would be um, resources of, as, and reef. Mm. Those are the two words, I think, that really, and that's what the debate, that's what the discussion, that's what the arguments on um, and you know which way it will play I think is interest is going to so, be very interesting. So how in the wake of Queensland Nickel centered on that community can the Palmer United Party the you know, sorry I beg your pardon the United Australia Party this time around I don't um, know be, I, I, explain the psychology of that to me I, please. I do not believe that people have that short-term memory I mean I really don't but when you actually see people being interviewed up there on the streets they're talking about the fact that Clive Palmer understands them um, you know I, I don't know how they can possibly see that Clive Palmer appear he's spending a fortune yes, yes. an absolute fortune yeah. and it's all about for him I think ensuring that mining continues in the Galilee Basin I think that if you had to sum down his policies I think that's maybe his main priority mm. to actually ensure that a party gets elected to government that actually you know you know, continues to promote or allow mining in, in, in a region where there's a lot of coal, sure, but there's also, you know, a heating planet. Well, they've also extinct. just experienced the most extraordinary natural disasters as well. And, yes. um, you know, that whole region has been devastated and not for the first time. Jacob, what do you make of uh, of Herbert um, and, and, and the Bahama United and the One Nation presence, I guess, in that seat? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I've, I've yeah, been focusing on the whole Queensland nickel of it all. Um, like Tracy, I sort of, I find it a little bit hard to reconcile, you know, Queensland nickel is based in Townsville, its main refinery is in Herbert as well. It's, it's difficult to see workers who are directly affected by all of this. And living, whose entitlements haven't been paid. Yeah, like still waiting to be paid. It's hard to see an electorate choosing even a portion of a, an electorate so affected choosing to go towards mm, yeah, yeah. Clive Palmer. Um, but yeah, when you, when you drill it down to there is still 
a demand for mining and, and the resources industry. There's a demand see. for jobs. That's what it yeah. is. There's yeah. a demand for jobs. And I'm not sure that the other side have articulated well enough the fact that um, renewable energies will also offer jobs, perhaps more than Adani. Yeah. You know, there's been massive amounts of employment yeah, yeah. figures thrown around by Huge Adani. Huge investments by the state um, government but, you know, in, in solar when you, and when you really drill it down, it's probably going to be more like a thousand jobs. You mm. know, not, it's not going to be in the thousands. And, and how many of the people up there who have aren't very skilled workers will have those jobs but, but I mean Jenny do you think for labor it comes down to how disengaged voters are that that it's actually in the end it's about advertising and it's about name recognition well I was going to say there must be an issue with the ALP candidate that she's not cutting through she's a woman she's from the left um, she's got a strong community background she has but there must worker. be something that she's not pulling uh, and I, I would be tempted to say mainly working class men and women mm. back to the fold mm. and I, I don't know the seat well enough to understand why she's not having that appeal and that they're looking for these kind of dare I say fringe parties um, but yeah she's just not being able to maintain that Labor vote. And we've alluded to the seat of Dawson Jacob but mm. this is the one that you've been very focused yeah, on. Yeah yeah. Tell us about the seat of Dawson and it's uh, colourful uh, incumbent uh, um, George Christensen's chances of holding on. Yeah yeah it's a tricky one so Dawson of course neighbours Herbert, um, the northern end of it uh, touches sort of part of Townsville, then it uh, goes down the coast through a few regional towns and then into uh, the top part of Gladstone. So uh, an interesting demographic, demographic um, Reef and Resources also quite well describes its industry. Uh, one in three male workers in Dawson are employed in either the mining or logistics industry, so mm. that's obviously big, yep. but then there's also a huge eco-tourism industry based on um, the reef and then places like Airlie Beach as mm, well. Mm, so mm. this real tension between the environment and, and mining really does play out very strongly there. In Dawson you've got the sitting member of George Christensen who has been a very interesting candidate. Um, he's sitting at the moment on a, a margin of about 3.4%, so he's a little bit Which safer Which has been than progressively whittled down mm. over, it was a much safer seat, wasn't it? Yes, um, yeah, so he's, he's it's, it's been, yeah, whittled away, but currently he's a little bit safer than either Cathy O'Toole and Herbert or um, Michelle Landry and Capricorn. Capricorn yeah, yeah. But Jacob, has the, um, the news, the fact that Christensen has spent an inordinate amount of time out of the country, um, has that resonated in polls? Has that seemed to, you know, be something that voters have considered? Not that I've seen. Yeah, it's tricky. He's, he's been nicknamed the member for Manila based yes, on the, yes. <laughs> the amount of time that he spent in the Philippines. Um, but yeah, it, it is really interesting and it's going to be really interesting to see where the protest votes in Dawson go because mm. I think that's what will ultimately mm, decide mm. it. In, the, in 2016, he got about 42% of the primary vote. Yep. Um, we would expect that it would be even lower this time around, so he will be relying on preferences mm. and it will be a question of where do those preferences come from. Yeah. One Nation didn't can put a candidate up in 2016. They have put a candidate up this time, so and that's quite close, isn't it, to where the state seat was won by the One Nation member? Yeah, um, yeah. So similar sort of area. Yeah. So potentially One Nation. It's it's interesting. George Christensen, because of his, um, he's deeply, deeply conservative, and so you would expect that some people who would be tempted to vote in One Nation in any other seat might still stay with the LNP because George Christensen has been so vocally mm, against mm, issues mm, like mm. gay marriage. And, and I mean, he like really that. has styled himself as the maverick candidate, hasn't he? Very active in the campaign against Turnbull. Um, he's been an absolute gift for Labor senators, though, and I think Murray Watt uh, has been particularly effective in, in lining Christensen up uh, yeah, and yeah. keeping a real focus on, um, on his travel uh, arrangements. Um, it's also drawn the attention of the, uh, the AFP and the security agencies, uh, as we saw in Senate estimates. Um, every election, the Griffith University team picks a wild card. Uh, and, and we debate it and we argue about it, don't we? We do. Uh, but this time we've settled on the seat of Ryan. Uh, the seat of Ryan is the 2019 wildcard. Um, let's take a look at it. 
So here we are in the heart of the federal electorate of Ryan. Traditionally a very safe Liberal hold, but this time around a combination of federal and local factors are combining to bring this very blue ribbon seat up for grabs. To give us the analysis of why this is the case, we're speaking to Dr Tracy Arclay. Look, Ryan is a very safe Liberal seat. It still is held on a margin of 9%, so it would require quite a swing to unseat the candidate who's standing for the LNP. It's also a really interesting election in that we don't have an incumbent. Um, Jane Prentice was quite unceremoniously dumped and, and Julian Simmons was pre-selected as the candidate for this seat. Angering, I think, probably some women voters particularly, with all the stuff about the Liberal Party not being great with women, it wasn't a particularly good look. The fact that the seat is tending to be a more green seat than many others in Queensland, um, it, it, we're up for an interesting election, I think. While Ryan is traditionally a safe Liberal seat, Dr Arclay says factors such as the way Jane Prentice lost pre-selection after successfully winning the past three elections have potentially changed that. Julia Bishop being treated not, not the best way in the leadership tussle and then Jane Prentice being dumped for um, a young man who she in her valedictory address alluded to as being impatiently ambitious perhaps does play into the narrative that the LNP has a problem with women. Local discontent has bubbled to the surface in the usually conservative seat. There's been a cute if not a little bit strange video put out talking about where's Jane. Where's Jane? Where's Jane? So there's been a few, a few things like that that's been happening. Many will watch with interest to see how much ground the Greens party gains this time around, particularly in the wake of the party's success gaining a seat with similar electoral boundaries as Ryan in the recent state election. A lot of people, I think, think it's going to play a part. It's going to be interesting to see how much it does. Certainly, we have a Greens member now for the seat of Maywa, which is a seat that used to be, you know, in Indrapilly. So I think the Greens will be a player in Ryan. To, to what degree that is and whether or not they can get enough support to actually be able to um, upset the election, I think, you know, is, is a very long bow. However, with local issues traditionally not holding much sway in federal elections, Dr Arclay says the battle is still too close to call, particularly with the lack of an incumbent also adding to the mix came as quite a surprise to many, many people, including I think some people inside the parliament who were shocked by the pre-selection of Julian Simmons to replace her so suddenly. She had won the seat very, very strongly. She didn't need preferences. She was an assistant minister who was doing um, a lot of work with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. She's also had a career outside of politics first, so she brought with her a lot of that kind of background in business that we don't see in many candidates, or at least we're seeing that less happening today. The replacement is, I think, what you'd call the new kind of politician that we're seeing, someone that has been steeped in the politics of the party. There's a degree of personal vote when you've got strong incumbents, and so when you lose that, you're basically, you know, levelling the playing field just a little bit. Julian Simmons, I don't think, will get the same level of support, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if he required some preferences to get over the line. So of course the big issue is that package showed, uh, Tracy, and you uh, nailed it I think, uh, it, you know, the disendorsement of, uh, or, or the challenge, the successful challenge by Julian Simmons, former staffer to um, Jane Prentice, uh, you, you know, you, the, the LNP's woman problem. Mm. Uh, how much of an issue is this going to be more generally and perhaps across the four seats that we've talked about uh, this, today? Ryan is my seat. I live in that electorate and I've been, you know, listening to the, the voices around the shopping centres and talking to people here and there. Right. Political scientists do research when they well, go through Absolutely, shop. absolutely. The every every, every conversation is an opportunity to learn more. Um, I, I have to honestly say that I haven't detected a huge amount of anger amongst normal people about Jane Prentice, although things like that little video does show that there, there was a groundswell of support mm, for her. Mm, and I think mm. it was a shock, the fact that 
someone who had won so um, without needing preferences, had won three elections, had been an assistant minister, was suddenly gone. For um, a 34-year-old young man who clearly saw his pathway to the Lord Mayoralty thwarted. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, that's, that, that's certainly what it looks like. Someone who'd been quite active, though, in the council, on the planning committee. Lots of controversial decisions around the planning committees. It's an opportunity to make friends, but it's also, also an opportunity to make a lot of enemies. And the electorate of Ryan, one of the things that when I look at the posts of Ryan, it's the traffic. You know, it's those sorts of everyday issues that people are getting fed up with. You know, mm. it takes you maybe an hour to traverse Moggle Road mm. at certain times of the day. Mm. Um, you know, it, you know, where in a normal time it'd take you 20 minutes to get the same yep, distance. Yep, yep. Um, his so this big is partly the pressures saying, of population growth in yep. the southeast that we've seen mm -hmm. and yes. are being dealt with in the context of the SEQ city deal. Um, but the lag in infrastructure investment. And um, clearly his big slogan saying Julian Simmons will fix roads, um, you know, indicates that he is aware of that. I'm not quite sure. I had this vision of him out there with the shovel fixing the potholes. Well, he wouldn't be know. the first, uh, he wouldn't <laughs> be the first former Lord, you know, Meryl no, Aspirin to, to so do, would he, in our context. Um, the woman issue in Dawson or in, in Dixon, you know, to, to what extent is that you know, I keep thinking that women and young people are going to be the decisive uh, force mm. in this election. Um, you know, we've got the very interesting example in Ryan. You know, what about the other seats? Well, I think um, Peter Dutton was seen to be bullying Ali France. Yeah. And obviously, um, the word came through fairly quickly that he had to kind of retract what he said. But, you know, it just endlessly plays into that. And I just don't understand with the LNP. They understand it's a problem, but they're putting a flashing light on it all the time. All the time, yeah. And one of their best and most effective campaigners, if we think back over recent campaigns, has been Julie Bishop. That's right. Uh, you know, totally missing, although yes. on the, on the uh, evening coverage. Yes. Uh, so that's very interesting. I still think it's got some some way to play out. Yeah, uh, I think I think that's problem. right. And I think progressively over time, you know, people are going to start. To, I mean, Jacinda Ardern is a great example of a different kind of politics where mm. those. Softer, by softer I don't mean less important, but those softer intuitive skills, that emotional intelligence, um, I think that we've been missing in Australian debates for a long time. And don't you think that's generational Resonates. as well, to some extent? Mm. You know, here's a woman who's not quite 40. Yeah, that's exactly um, right. And, you know, I mean, maybe there's opportunities this election with the extraordinary exodus of long term members uh, to see some generational and change. And increasing numbers of young people enrolling to vote mm. who are concerned about the sorts of issues that you know, for a long time, the Liberal Nationals have not wanted to tackle climate change being the number mm, one concern. Mm, mm. Um, I think those are the sorts of things that, you know, with this influx of new voters under the age of 30, I think it, it, they could really play and a part. I mean, part. that's something we follow quite closely, isn't it, Jacob, in terms of the same-sex marriage plebiscite, then uh, the state election and the, you know, the extraordinary change on the electoral roll in some of these key seats. Yeah, yeah. And what, what's really interesting is that a lot of these new voters aren't being picked up in the polling that's done because the polls only use landlines a lot of the time. Mm. And, you know, millennial, I don't have a landline. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's... Yeah, it will be interesting to see whether some of the polls are underestimating uh, and we know that younger voters traditionally are a bit more progressive, so it will be interesting to see whether the polls are underestimating that progressive vote in some of these really key seats. So, so what we do know at this stage is that preferences are going to be essential, yes, mm, uh, fundamental absolutely. and perhaps never more important than in this campaign. Um, but how do they work? Uh, I think it's really important for people to think about how their preferences are going to uh, work and, and Jacob's going to explain that uh, for you now. Australia is one of the few countries that uses compulsory preferential voting for our elections. But what is it? Let's look at how it works in the House of Representatives. On your green ballot paper, you must rank all the candidates, otherwise your vote won't be counted. Number one for your first choice, number two for your second choice, and so on. When the votes are tallied, if no candidate obtains more than 50% of first preference votes, then the one with the lowest number of votes is eliminated. The votes for that candidate are then distributed amongst the remaining candidates, according to second preferences. If there is still no one with a simple majority, the second last candidate is eliminated and their votes are redistributed as well. 
This continues until a candidate achieves a simple majority. The idea is that preferential voting results in an elected candidate who more closely represents the will of the people. So when you're voting, consider how your preferences might flow, as that could have a big impact on who gets elected. So we've talked a bit about the exodus of, uh, of, of experience uh, at this campaign, and of course one of the big drivers of that uh, is the, the Turnbull Leadership Challenge uh, and the rise of the right, of the hard right, uh, many argue, in the party. Um, you know, for people outside Queensland uh, who, you know, who, had, who looked at the Dutton challenge, uh, at the constant undermining of Turnbull, um, really, you know, obviously might ask the question, uh, why does that happen here? Um, you know, why has this group galvanised so strongly when the electorate is clearly not as um, conservative as, as they are? I guess it begs the question about um, you, you know, wh what is left of moderate uh, capacity within the LNP? I think, you know, if the Liberals went back to what they started to be, it was representing a group of people who were not trade unionists, were not blue collar workers, but also weren't, you know, um, men mainly of the land yeah. you know yeah. so and and you know over time the party you know came to represent I think that kind of economic conservative but socially progressive voter since Abbott's election that has progressively whittled away mm. and I think it's been really interesting I mean I don't know whether you describe Abbott as a conviction politician but his convictions certainly I don't think don't echo his own electorate for a start um, you know, for someone that's been around for a very long time, not being able to tailor the message, not being able to... Because he, I think he does get out there and talk to people. Mm. But there is just something in his being that, you know, the things that he believes in, he can't let go of. Mm. And, um, and, and he's being left behind. Australians have moved on now. It's a different kind of climate, and I don't think many of the Liberals have yet understood that. It's been put to me, Jenny, that, um, that the party, and of course, you know, the Liberals was always the weak coalition partner in Queensland, which Absolutely. is very important. The National Party was always the dominant partner, and, you know, from the Bjorki Peterson. Getting um, back to era that Queensland onwards. difference thing again. Well, sure. <laughs> um, you know, there'd been a financial drain as well, you know, over, over many years. So, so the, the Liberal part has never been that strong, always highly factionalised around personalities. Um, but, but where do. You know, Tracy's talked about Warringah, where we've seen a, uh, you know, you know, and also in um, uh, in Malcolm Turnbull's seat. Wentworth. Thank you, which is currently eludes me. <laughs> <laughs> and also in the seat of Wentworth, um, you know, the emergence of, uh, you know, uh, li you know, effectively smaller mm. liberal independent candidates. We're not seeing that here. No, and I think that's interesting, and I think that's what makes Dixon a bit tricky, because in those other seats. Uh, those kind of socially progressive, economically conservative liberals have somewhere to park their vote. Mm. So they can go to Zali Stegall or whatever and feel comfortable mm. that she will represent them. Mm. Um, whereas in Queensland, it's still a stark choice. So you don't have that opportunity to park your vote. Mm. And I think it's a long call for disenfranchised and disenchanted liberals to then go to Labor. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to make it a bit and, tricky. And, and partly that. that's about the dominance of the left in Labor at the state level, isn't it? Mm. You know, where, where it's the dominant faction yeah. now. Yes. So, you know, so those state issues do echo uh, in, into the sort of federal arena. Yes. And, and I think, um, I mean, people like Abbott and Dutton are, come from that hardball political culture. Mm. And I think we're seeing the dying death throes of that. And mm. the fact that Liberal women are just leaving in droves, some of them sitting members who are leaving. And um, not leaving quietly. Not leaving quietly. So I think in the next parliament, you're going to end up with a strong kind of, you know, crossbench of these very interesting, mm. effective, liberal style yeah. Independent yeah. women. Mm, yeah. I think. Why? Um, why is the LNP so flat-footed that it can't stretch out its arm and keep those well, people well, content? Well, and I think you know this is very interesting, Jacob. It's been put to me, and we think about you know George Christensen, Matt Canavan, um, you know Stuart Robert, the, the sort of the people who were core to the uh, the, t the Dutton uh, challenge. Um, it's been put to me that they are old fogies, young old fogies. 
Um, is this something about being generationally out of step mm. um, because of the deep immersion in career politics? What, what do you think is going on with this? You know, as Jenny says, they seem to flash a light on it. They don't seem to be able to understand. Uh, it eludes them. Yeah, it is, it is interesting when you look at the histories of some of these uh, candidates and their, their progression through the political wings of the party rather than, you know, long and rich careers in the public service or even out in, in business and things like that. So mm -hmm. it, it is interesting the environments in which candidates are being socialised and then the values that they are picking up as part of that process. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we would, we would t typically expect to see people of sort of Matt Canavan's generation to be perhaps a little bit more progressive, but when we don't see that, yeah, we, we mm. raise questions why. Yeah, and I mean, you alluded to the um, career politics uh, experience in the, in the Ryan package, Tracy. Mm. Um, I mean, I think Ryan, had there been a strong, independent, socially progressive, economically conservative candidate, they would have really given the two parties a run for their money, particularly the LNP, I think, at the moment. Um, but there isn't one. So people either have the choice of, of voting Greens, and the seat has progressively voted mm. Greens. And there's a state overlay, it's the only Green member in That's the exactly right, in, in Maywa. In Maywa. So, mm. you know, the state seat of Maywa is part of Ryan. So, you know, there is a bit of a precedent there. But whether or not that, that's also in the Indrapilly area that covers university students and covers, you know, mm. a, a more urban population. Ryan is also quite a widespread electorate yep. and there's also lots of other types of areas, and acreage, properties and mm. things like that, mm. established families mm. who I, I'm not quite sure they'll be able to go for Greens. All Although climate change really is an issue out there. Yeah. Um, but they're still not the candidates in winnable seats uh, for the LNP. <laughs> no, that's right. But it, I mean, that is a fascinating issue, isn't it? The, and we saw it in Victoria as well. This, this absolute incapacity to deal with the woman issue mm. um, and the persistent denial of it, actually. And, and this amazing. should have been the symbolic turning point for the LNP this election. They should have yeah. pre selected these kind of women who are now running as independent candidates, uh, they should have gone all out to demonstrate we are now changing this pattern. Exactly. And they can't. But and they we can't, can't have some people it. progressing at the expense of others and I think this might mm. be the essential point that you're, that you're missing, Jenny. Um, <laughs> the campaign so far has really been a contrast of styles, hasn't it? Um, you know, oppositions run small targets uh, in recent Australian politics since the, uh, since the 1993 uh, you know, fight back election. Um, but we, and, and Labor has been very clear, hasn't it, that it's going to come uh, to government if, if, it's, if it gets there uh, through the front door. Labor's gone very uh, strong on policy. Uh, how is that tactic working? Um, it, will this be seen as a mistake uh, in, the, in the big wash up if, if Bill Shorten doesn't become Prime Minister? What do you make of, um, of the policy rich versus policy light dynamics? It's interesting and I think that more policy debate in an election campaign is a refreshing change. I think what you were saying before Tracy, um, you know, the electorate seems to have moved past these you know, three, three word words, slogans, slogans yeah. and things like that. They are looking for a bit more meat in the debate and so the fact that Labor is providing that I think is a good thing. Mm. What is interesting is that the Liberals haven't risen to meet that challenge. They've still kept a very tight ship talking about economic management and not a lot else. Not and we've, lot else. we've seen in the past week taxes. or so. Well, and criticising all the policies that Labor is outlining. Yeah. So we've, we've seen Scott Morrison, Josh Frydenberg, because they're the only ones they're the only allowed ones in front of the camera. <laughs> they're prompted to say, you know, beyond economic management, what have you got? Yeah. And yeah. They're and really you can see the journalists turning to that now, can't mm. you? you know? yeah. Beyond that, what's the agenda? What's the forward agenda? Well, it's in the budget papers, um, and they don't sort of want to get much outside that. But but Labor are, have you know have really bought themselves a fight with franking credits. They have. Um, yeah. you know, but they've it, also it, gone out and explained it very well. Both Chris Bowen and then the other night on Q and A, I saw Shorten, and they both you know they explained why they're doing that because you know the reality is there aren't 
limited. There, there aren't unlimited resources. Mm. And you've got to, as a country, decide where you want to spend money. And even though it's hard to take things away, I think it's a warning to future governments, though. Don't, when you've got a huge mining boom and you've got a lot of wealth coming in, give it away in gifts of tax because it comes back to bite you. It might be decades later. Mm. But, you know, if that money had been spent instead, not on baby bonuses, not on, you know, giving retirees, you know, basically government money. It's, it's, it's another government payment. Well, I mean, he's uh, short and shifted the narrative to subsidy. This is a subsidy. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he does, you know, he's, he's trying to explain it. And, and in a way, I've been surprised that he's gone a bit harder. Uh, he's certainly sort of upped, upped the ante around that rhetoric in the, in the leaders' debate last week here in Brisbane. Labor's also bought itself a very significant <laughs> fight on negative gearing. And, you know, you know this is a, an assault, the government would have us um, believe, on nurses and police who seem to, and teachers who seem to be the primary negative gearers from, <laughs> from what we hear in the debate. Um, do you think we'll, it'll be interpreted as a mistake in the washer? Look, I don't think the negative gearing is a carryover from the last campaign. So they have been consistent on that policy for two campaigns. We have to fundamentally change the structural setting of housing policy in Australia. Mm. And everyone understands that. Well, everybody's that. understood that for 30 and years. And it's grandfathered. Yeah. So really, I think that one is fine, and I think um, that won't be an issue. The retire... The, oh, now I'm about to say the retiree tax. I think um, that has really pushed off a negative campaign which the LNP are jumping on with all those TV ads all the time. But I think this is the only path to government that the ALP have. Right. They've been a very cohesive, consistent um, leadership team and shadow cabinet for a long time. They've done, done the policy work. Bill Shorten has identified and talks about the way we need new politics. And if they didn't demonstrate that during this campaign, it is really, it's, it's the, I think they're trying to do a circuit breaker yeah. mm. um, from the past and they really have to walk that talk mm. and say, we have put our policies out there, we're seeking a mandate, we're not hiding anything. Yes, which yeah. is the sort of the, the riffing off the, you know, still the 2013-14 budget of, you know, they made a commitment and then they came in and, mm. and kind of didn't honour it. Yeah. Um, let's talk about... Um, Clive Palmer, because we have to, you can't drive anywhere along Moggle Road or anywhere else Elephant without, in the see, <laughs> without <laughs> seeing those yellow signs. Um, can you buy a seat in federal parliament in Australia? Yeah, the campaigns call for a lot of money and Clive Palmer has been splashing around a ton of money, yeah. but campaigning is more than just advertising. You need actually some substance to that advertising. Oh, yeah. And well, you would hope so. Um, and so what I think will be interesting is when we get the results is, yeah, whether that has translated. We've seen him splash the money, but has he been able to back it up with policy? And are voters buying that or not? And, 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 oh, sorry, no, say, and, and as well as policy, you need to actually have an organisation of win. Yes. And this is a very thin, fragile kind of entity. Um, deeply personalised. Deeply personalised. I think he just must have thrown an ad in the paper and got a candidate in every seat. It's very hard to find out who these people are. Well, he's all also kind of re links. required them to uh, sign an agreement that they'll pay back any expenses if they okay. defect. <laughs> On his experience of last time. I believe. So, so though he's else? made a whole lot of preference commitments, I mean, you need people out at every polling booth in every electorate. Yeah for that to have any kind of bite. And you know, and he's paid people in the past and he might pay people again, but you can't pay people to cover every polling booth in Queensland. So I think that's where some of this stuff falls down. Mm. And I think, you know, the ground game, which we haven't talked about at all, which Labor, of course, will, will be far, far stronger in, and they have really targeted uh, the north of the state, haven't they? I mean, mm. Shorten has done, uh, and, and the Shadow Cabinet have done, you know, town hall meeting after town hall meeting and been very visible. Uh, what impact, Tracy, on the day will will the ground game difference have? I look. I, I'm not sure about what impact it will have. Hopefully, it will have some impact because I think, you know, Clive Palmer spent a fortune and he's got double page ads in papers like the Australian and all over the place. But he hasn't articulated really what he's going to do if he gets into Parliament. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, Labor have gone out there and they have tried to explain things. And mm. for a political scientist, you know. 
government is a really serious business. It affects all of us and, and you'd hope that people are listening, asking questions, challenging them. And um, and that you know, and that they're learning more about and the process of government. And perhaps focusing on their record because he was comprehensively um, repudiated as the member for Fairfax. Yes. Um, you know, with a very ambivalent record. Oh, yes. and, and he didn't go to Parliament. So uh, I, I don't understand why he's got this desperate drive to be a parliamentarian no, and know. actually not be there to vote on legislation. I, I, I don't understand that. It's approaching six hundred thousand Australians. Um, who've pre-polled vote. It may it's even over be more a, by it, was, it ticked over to a million on Tuesday. Oh, amazing. Yep, they're projecting five million by, well, people will have voted before polling day. How it's, do we understand that? What, what, what's, what, A, what's driving it? B, what implications will it have? It's, it's really interesting. It's probably convenience more than anything is what's driving it. People don't want to spend hours lining up on their Saturday if they can just pop to a polling booth. On and we love this kind of thing, we can't at all understand. <laughs> and you don't spend hours, that's the thing. No, I mean, see the queues are very rarely even 30 minutes, mm. rarely. But it's this, yeah, it's this, why would I spend my Saturday voting in for someone mm. who I don't particularly like when I can pop in the week before and do it on my way home from work? Do you yeah, think it's got anything to do with incivility? Do you think it's that that people, you know, we saw the egging incident with the Prime Minister, uh, you know, do you think it's about people's concern about incivility, having to sort of traverse the, uh, the, the people handing out how to vote cards? I mean, you still get that. There's still, you still have to run that gauntlet even on, on pre-polling day. It's interesting the, in terms of incivility, in terms of a sort of a sense of civic duty to mm, vote and mm. that, you know, the voting day is a day where we come together as an Australian community and choose our government. Whether that is in decline and whether pre-polling undermines that sense of community, I think is an interesting debate that has been going on. Whether it's, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna run that gauntlet no matter which day you go. So mm. I, I don't know that. Do so you think it's much more about convenience? What about the seats that it's occurring in? Does it, are they significant? I mean, I've seen some of the analysis of seats like Flinders, of, of other seats that, uh, you know, where, where candidates, um, uh, you know, people have been drawing conclusions about people rushing out to vote, having made up their well, mind. I think the parties are concerned about it because I heard yesterday or read somewhere that the parties are starting to talk about the fact that maybe they should reduce the amount of pre-polling time. Mm. because it affects the whole electoral campaign mm, cycle. Absolutely. You absolutely. know, when you actually let you get your messages out, when you actually start to, you know, people, you know, unless they've been really listening to and reading a lot, they won't know all the policies, presumably, when polling first opened. Um, you know, so I don't know what that tells us about um, I, I think people's care people factor. just want the pain over. Mm. And they think, well, I voted now, I can shoot out for the next couple I don't have to listen to it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could yeah. well be right. But what I think is interesting is, um, and this has been a trend for the last few elections, and Labor has recalibrated its campaign to take into account. So it had the launch, mm. an earlier launch. It's got all its policies out. I think it's even putting um, its final costings out very soon. Yes, I think uh, I think Shorten indicated Thursday. And mm. normally it's like the Friday before, before. the Saturday election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, the LNP have been a bit flat-footed, and I just assumed both major parties would recalibrate. Well, and, and I don't understand why, why, why they haven't. And the coalition launch, of course, is going to be on Sunday. Now, there's tactical reasons for doing that, because it means you can use the advantages of incumbency until That's you right, actually exactly. have your campaign launch. But again, to go back to your lights on it kind of point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mother's Day. Mm. Um, as the day for the launch. So, you know, in lots of ways, Jacob, uh, the rhythms of the campaign as we go into the last week uh, are going to be unconventional by what we're used to given this pre-polling trend. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. And of course, we've had all the, the public holidays at the start of the election campaign as well that really threw a spanner in the works to campaigning. And, you know, that was a critical time given that pre-polling was about to open. Mm. And so, as Jenny said, Labor being so out there well in advance of the election even being called, being clear about mm. what its vision for Australia was, mm. has really helped them navigate that tricky campaign. And period. yet it's not showing up in the polls. No, I know. I know. It's and so do we, you know, as we've done after every election, go, oh, well, the polls don't tell us anything anymore because <laughs> millennials don't have landlines. Uh, I guess we'll have to see. Um, Next week on the show, we will be looking at the election grand final. 
we'll be coming into the last week of the campaign and approaching um, the, the decision time, I guess, uh, for both parties. Um, thanks so much uh, to all of the politics nerds that have uh, tuned in today. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you next week uh, to Below the Line.